Hi guys, how are y'all doing? I, you, okay, there we are. Just making sure we're, can somebody give me a yes or a thumbs up or anything? Just let me know that you can hear me and see me okay. That I'm coming through and that you are receiving the signal. Okay, thanks guys, thanks. So it's been a few, seems like it's been more than a few. It seems like it's been a long time uh, since we were on here. Um, and we're going to get back to talking about magic, hopefully, even depending on how long it takes us to, you know, go over all the details of the hearing, hopefully even today. But I did just want to um, tell you all about the hearing, kind of keep you updated about it. Uh, it was I've been really sick ever since we got home. Um, you know, I saw somebody talking in the comments just a minute ago, right before we came on, someone was asking a question about, uh, has anyone else ever experienced, you know, like fever or something when they were going through something like this, you know, like something to call it what it is traumatic, because that's what, that's what the situation was. It was trauma and it was meant to be traumatic. Um, these people meant to try to hurt me in every way they could. Uh, but I'm going to, uh, let's see, I'll, I'll run, you know, th there's so much to go over, but my point is the reason I started talking about, you know, someone saying, has anyone else ever experienced things like that, like fever? Um, that's one of the effects of trauma. You know, when you go through some sort of trauma, either like, and it can be like emotional or mental, you know, even when you experience something like the death of someone close to you, sometimes it can make you incredibly ill. Or if you've ever been in a fight, like a real fight, I don't mean like, you know, school kids rolling around on the ground, but like an actual fight. There were times afterwards when I felt like I had the flu for about a week after after being in a fight because it's it's trauma it affects you know all of these things all of this stuff is is intertwined and tied together you know when you're talking about things like people having like for example a broken heart the reason we talk about things like that is is it's not like literally your physical heart that is broken it's the energetic counterpart of your heart that has sustained some sort of damage or wounding. Things in this world can hurt us on more levels than just the physical. You know, you can affect, just like when we're doing magic, we're affecting the physical world by manipulating energy. As above, so below. Well, the opposite is true also. You can affect the energetic world by affecting the physical world. So if something affects you physically, it also affects you energetically. Sometimes in, in massive ways, you know, I remember I've told y'all about this before, like my grandmother, when she had to have one of her legs cut off um, and she would for at least two years after her leg was cut off, sometimes at night she would cry and she would say she could still feel her foot, that her foot was hurting. And I would touch the end of the stump where they had cut her leg off. And I would I ask her, I said, is this it? Is this where it's hurting? And she would say, no, it's down below. Like it's where my foot is. My foot is hurting. Well, the reason it was hurting is because there was no physical body there anymore for to, to act as a, a house for her energetic, her, what, what's the word, you, whatever word you want to call it, like astral or etheric or, or whatever limb. Uh, it didn't have a physical home anymore. It was literally dying. You know, most people can't, don't know how to take in spiritual sustenance. You know, unless they've done something like, you know, any of the Eastern traditions, it doesn't even have to be magic, but any of the Eastern traditions like Tai Chi or any of that sort of stuff, uh, you're learning how to sustain yourself energetically, feed your soul. And most people 
never take up anything like that. So the only way that their energetic body gets fed is by the food that they eat. You know, when, when you eat, it's like, say, for example, an apple, you're not just consuming the physical apple, you're consuming the chi, the life force of the apple. But going through this this past week, it really knocked the life out of me. But it wasn't entirely bad. You know, just I, I'm, I'm trying to remember one of the reasons I've been in, you know, wanting to get on here and talk about this is before I start to forget details, because you guys know that I forget a lot of stuff. <clears throat> and I wanted to kind of you know, talk about this and cement it and preserve it. So let's see, where should I start? I guess whenever we get there, you know, we, I, I drove to Arkansas from New Orleans for the hearing and I went up the day before the hearing, stayed in a hotel that night and we got up the next day and the hearing is supposed to start at 9.30 in the morning. First off, it did not start at 9.30 in the morning. Uh, we got there and um, everyone had to stand in the parking lot, like all the media, all supporters who were there, the, me, my defense team, like they just got everybody standing in the parking lot, won't even let us into the courtroom for a really long time. I don't even know how long it was. I heard somebody say it was like 90 minutes or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. They, Oh, they, um, Alicia, Alicia dissolve says they wouldn't even let you in the building. Yeah. I mean, it was, it, it, it was absolutely insane. So we get there, we're standing around waiting to get in. Finally, they announced they're going to open the door and let us into the courtroom, but they're only going to let about 15 people into the courtroom. There was no reason for this. The only purpose for this, I mean, this judge was incredibly abusive, malicious, and malignant. She knew what she was going to do before this hearing, you know, bef before we ever got there, she knew what she was going to do. That's exactly right. John says psychological warfare. Exactly. That's exactly what, what she did. It was psychological warfare. The thing is what people like that don't understand with me is there's nothing you can do to me that hasn't already been done. There's no name you can call me. There's no way you can hurt me. There is nothing that these people can do to me that I haven't already been through. So I don't even really, you know, get super upset about it anymore. I didn't get mad or, or anything else, but it was shocking. You know, it, it, it literally shocked me just because we didn't know what we were walking into. You know, we thought we were going to a fair hearing. We, when I walked into that courtroom, you know, I talked to Bob Ruff the night before. Um, we were at dinner and he was sitting across the table from me. And I said, you know, I just want to say thank you because I know that we would not be here right now doing this if not for the work that you would put into this case. And, you know, just bringing in people who, you know, just everything you've done to get this case this far. And that you have probably provided me with the last opportunity that I'll have to ever see my name clear. I've, we, you know, not just me, everybody felt like this is it. Like something's finally going to be done. Like we, like, you know, who doesn't want DNA testing to be done unless they have something to cover up? 
unless they have something to hide. Why would they have not wanted the testing done? We're thinking maybe, you know, this is a woman that's going to have some integrity or some dignity or, you know, want to see the truth done here. We didn't comprehend that it's the entire system in Crittenden County. It's not even just, it's not even just uh, West Memphis. It's the county where West Memphis is, which is called Crittenden County in Arkansas. The entire county, the judicial system, the cops, all of it is so incredibly corrupt. You know, one of the things that, that people don't realize, and, and I was talking about this with someone recently, and they, they said, have you ever talked about this with someone before? And I said, no, I've never told anyone this when I was telling them a, a very specific thing. Like we were talking about, like why the cops focused on me in the first place. And, you know, there used to be, not in West Memphis, but in the next little town over in the same county, still in Crittenden County, there was what they called a, a juvenile juvenile task force that consisted of three cops. Two of them are dead now. One of them was eventually forced to resign after he was caught molesting a young boy in a public bathroom. The boy's mother called him. No charges were ever pressed against him. He wasn't fired, nothing. Uh, he was just, he had to resign. That's all it was. Well, those three cops, when I was a kid, when I was a teenager, they used to come through our neighborhood all the time. And they did this to a lot of young boys. They used to do like pick up teenage boys all the time and essentially tell them, you know, either you perform sexual favors for me or you're going to jail. They probably caused deep, severe trauma and scarring in the psyches and souls of a lot of, lot of young boys. One of the reasons that they targeted me, and keep in mind one of them, who is not even a West Memphis police officer, was my brain went blank. Give me one second. Oh, was one of the people who found the bodies. I'm, I've never been convinced he found them. I think he knew they were there the entire time. This is the same person that if you remember, keep in mind, whenever, whenever I was in court during the trial, the cops always said they never even considered me a suspect until like a month after the murders. But this guy admitted that the second they pulled the bodies out of the water, the second they found those children murdered, the very first thing out of his mouth was Damien Eccles finally did it. He probably, he, he, he's finally killed someone. They used to try that stuff with me and I wasn't, I wasn't going for it. You know, I used to make sure I used to like have to do things to defend myself against these people all the time. Like anytime I would have to go in, go into the place and meet with them. Like they would set these arbitrary meetings and say, you have to come in and, you know, uh, give us a status report or, you know, who, who the hell knows? It was just excuses, just reasons to try to get me into their office. I always made sure that my dad was with me. You know, this was when I was really young, teenager. And that pissed them off royally. They did not like that. But 
these were the people, these, I mean, honestly, just to call them what they were, just a little pack of molesters. These were the people who were responsible for shifting the focus of this case onto me. All the other stuff was just the icing on the cake. You know, the fact that I dressed in black, the, the, that I was listening to heavy metal music, um, you know, the art I had hanging on my walls. Those things were just like the icing on the cake and the things that they used to convince people to send me to prison, to find me guilty and send me to prison. But the reasoning, you know, the, the where this whole thing, st it, it started a long time before this case. It started when these three cops used to come into our neighborhood and molest teenage boys. So my point in telling you this is it's not like isolated. It's not just West Memphis. For all I know, it could very well be all of Arkansas. I don't know. I don't have experiences with, you know, every county in Arkansas, but I do know that it is rife in Crittenden County. the corruption. So when we go into the courtroom, when they finally let us in, the first thing they did is uh, would not let Lori and I, it would not let Lori, they would not let Lori sit anywhere even close to me. They took her and put her all the way in the back of the courtroom over in the corner. Not only that, but they also turned the air conditioner up as loud as they could turn it, like turned it all the way up. And then the judge was mumbling so low that Lori said, even sitting in the back of the courtroom, she said she couldn't hear anything being said. She could not hear anything the judge was saying. And I found out later, most people in the courtroom said the same thing. Another thing, you know, like Bob Ruff made those T-shirts and some of you guys got them, the, the test the evidence shirts. And the whole point of them was to raise money to pay for the expert witness that we needed. You know, the, it was someone to, you know, describe to the court how the testing works and, uh, you know, how long it was going to be able to answer questions to the court. So, you know, we had to reserve that that expert witness. You have to pay them and, and you know, set, set up everything for them. Just It's a whole ordeal. And, you know, you're, you're paying someone for their time and money and everything else. I should have known what was happening whenever we walked into the courtroom and they were going to have to do the expert witness through... Um, like a Zoom thing. They had like a, you know, they got like a TV screen in there and uh, they were going to have the expert witness because she couldn't come to Arkansas for some reason. I can't remember what it was, but she was going to, to testify through Zoom. Whenever my attorney's assistant went to hook up the machine, so that everybody could see the video and talk to this woman, the judge stopped her and said, don't worry about that. Just go sit down. So we went through all of that trouble to obtain this expert witness. People bought t-shirts to pay for it. We had to hire this woman. The judge never even let her testify. We were never even allowed to talk about the DNA testing. So that was one thing. Wasted our time, wasted our money, wasted our energy. Normally, if a court hearing is, if a court hearing is going to be like the one we went to, 
it's not they don't they don't have court for that. You know, she could have made that ruling months ago from the bench without making all of these people travel across the country to show up for this hearing that she knew we were not even going to be allowed to have. Who says that? Carly. Carly says, is this legal? In the UK, this wouldn't happen. The thing that a lot of people don't understand in the US is they it doesn't it really doesn't matter what the law says. They can do anything they want to to you. They can do absolutely anything they want to to you. You know, you see on TV that you have like rights, things like that. In real life, all that stuff goes right out the window. It's all manipulated and so what else? What else was important about it? Oh, this was something I had talked about a little bit on, on Twitter. Uh, and I think it's still posted up right now on like the stories on Instagram where this judge actually tried to shame me for taking the Alfred plea. You know, she's, she um, essentially says, if you wanted to do DNA testing, you shouldn't have taken the Alfred plea. You should have just stuck it out and went to this, you know, magical court date that everybody talks about that you had coming up at the end of the year. And you should have went to this court and you could have asked for testing there. Well, the problem with that logic and reasoning is, number one, they couldn't do this kind of DNA testing back then. It did not even exist. And number two, do you know how many men I saw put to death begging that they do DNA testing before they killed them and they didn't. Those men all died. I had watched person after person be killed while they were asking for DNA testing. You know, they try to make it sound, you know, that all sounds good or whatever in theory, but in reality, Yes, should have just waited on death row. What else? What was I just talking about? Sorry, my brain's going a little blank today. What were we just talking about? The judge, the DNA, oh, the DNA testing and the, the guys that I saw executed who were trying to get DNA testing all the way up until the point that they were killed. You know, she can say stuff like that to the world because the world doesn't know this stuff. You know, the average person who sees this, you know, re reporting about this uh, case on TV, they would probably hear what she said and think, well, that sounds right. Because they don't know the reality of the situation. You know, everything they're talking about, you know, those those would be people whose, you know, whose knowledge of the judicial system comes from either you know, books they've read or TV shows they've watched or, you know, movies or something, not from being sucked into the system and ground down to dirt inside of it. That's another one of the reasons they take away your voting rights whenever they send you to prison is because when you go to prison, you see the inside of the system. You see the corruption. You see the judges. You see the attorney generals. You see the prosecutors. You see what they're doing. Well, once you've seen the inside of the system, they don't want you being able to change it. So that's one of the reasons they take your voting rights. Yeah, making a mystic says, how about they experience what you had to go through and see what choice they would make? I bet my ass they wouldn't wait it out. That's exactly 100% true. You know, it's there was a, a famous quote by Mike Tyson one time. He said, everybody's got a plan until they get punched in the face. 
you know, when the blows start flying, all those finely laid, intricate and detailed plans a lot of times go out the window. The point of that is, you know, it's it's fine to you'll see these people all the time saying like, well, if it were me, I would have done this. Or if I were if 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 I were him, I would have done that. And, you know, if he really wanted to be found innocent, he wouldn't have done this. You know, all that kind of stuff. Is it's just what they call arm armchair quarterbacking. The fact of the matter is you really don't know what you would do in an insanely traumatic situation until you are in that insanely traumatic situation. It's easy to philosophize and come up with theories and all this kind of stuff. But it's like they say, when, when you get to the point where the rubber meets the road, it's a different world. It's not about theories anymore. It's not about philosophies or any of that kind of stuff. What you think you would have done when you're in those situations, you find out what you really are. You find out what you are really made of. You find out how strong you are and you find out how weak you are. You find out what will break you. And you find out what won't. Most of the people who speculate on stuff like that are people who have never, never had to go through those sorts of things. That's actually a really good, con Dusty says, circumstances don't make a man. They reveal him to himself. There is a lot of truth in that. There is a lot of truth in that. When you're going through hardship, when you're going through darkness, that's when you learn what you really are and what's really important to you and what's really not important and all that stuff. So next steps, what we're going to do. Oh, oh, the other thing. Yeah. Uh, they tried to, they did try to keep me out of the courtroom. First off, uh, the judge there were three prosecutors at the table, the state's table. There were three prosecutors sitting there. They never even had to argue against me. The judge argued their entire case for them. All they had to do is sit there at the table and let her do their work. Well, I had a point to this. Oh, the reason that they tried to keep me out of the courtroom, the justification they tried to use. Keep in mind. The judge is not wearing a mask. Nobody at the prosecutor's table is wearing a mask. My attorney was not wearing a mask. They would not let me into the courtroom unless I was wearing a mask. I'm the only one in the front of the courtroom forced to wear a mask. She was trying everything she could to show me I'm not running anything here. I'm not in control of anything and that she can do whatever she wants to to me. That was the whole point of that. She was using it as a form of punishment, punitive. Stuff like that, you know, just just little digs, things to try to, to, you know, hurt me in any way that she could. Like I said, you know, one thing alone, you know how many times I've been strip searched over the years? Probably thousands. I've been strip searched thousands of times, sometimes twice a day. You think after going through something like that, she's going to break me by making me wear a paper mask? 
but they don't understand that because they've never been through those things. They think, they think that you're like they are. What else was it? Just read what y'all are talking about in case you're bringing up some questions. One second. So Catherine says, felt so hostile and dark. No need for that many officers in that type of gear being that unreasonably controlling to the crowd who were peaceful and respectful despite the circumstances and conditions. That's actually a really, that reminds me of something. Uh, what Catherine just said, um, a lot of y'all may be familiar with Jason Louv. You know, the, uh, he teaches chaos magic. Uh, he was actually there at the hearing. And one of the things, you know, he came, he lives in Texas now and he came from Texas to it. But one of the things that he said was, <laughs> what's up with all this tactical gear to handle a bunch of sensitive goths? And it's true. I mean, these guys were dressed like they were going to war. You know, they were dressed like like SWAT team, like heavily armed SWAT teams for a bunch of, you know, people who were doing nothing but showing up because they wanted to support me or not see someone else screwed off or because they finally wanted to know who killed those kids. Those are the people that they showed up to intimidate and abuse. One of the cops, and here's the thing, they weren't all bad. One of them actually ended up being like really friendly and apologized to us for everything that we were going through. He told us, he said, you know, I'm sorry that you're having to deal with this. I'm sorry you're going through this. He said, they, he said, they have never done this in this courtroom in the past, like two years. Like we have never seen them doing this to anyone. They are doing this because it's you. They're doing this to you because it is you. And he apologized to us for it. And stuff like that actually does mean a lot. You know, when you're in a situation like that and you see that, you know, that not every single one of them is trying to deliberately bring about your death. Uh, it mean, it, it, it's, it means something. So we appreciated the fact that there was even, you know, one, one cop there that saw us as human. Yes, Catherine says he was nice and embarrassed at what he was being asked to do by the uppers. He said so. Exactly. That's the, that's the exact same thing he said to me. You know, he said there was, there was no reason for, for what was being done. Oh, they also, you know, it was hot. It was like a hundred and something degrees that day, you know, standing out there in that hot ass sun. And some of the people that showed up weren't. You know, not everybody's young. You know, some of these people, like, I had this this old preacher from Alabama shows up with his wife. These are not young people. They told them they had to stand out in the sun. They, you know, they wanted to go sit in their car where they could at least turn the air conditioning on and not stand out in this 100-degree sun. And the cop said... Uh, if you get in your car, you will be forced to leave. You are not allowed to sit in your car. It's just crazy. None of it made any sense. Catherine says, elderly and children, all of us sunburnt. Exactly. So 
two things. Aldo and Hypno are both saying two, asking two questions that, that tie in very much together. Uh, Aldo says, can you appeal this ruling? And Hypno says, am I, am I wrong for saying this is a type of magic? I, I think when you're asking, are you wrong in saying this is a type of magic? I think what you're asking is, is what they were doing a type of magic? Um, and, you know, really, when you get down to it, there is nothing in this world that is not an act of magic. I was talking to uh, Mark Stavish one time when he was in New York. And we were talking about things like, you know, like filing taxes. And I was saying, you know, I have no no tolerance or, you know, I don't want to hear like when people are having like mundane, you know, conversations about like like mundane things like, you know, uh, it's tax season again or, you know, all the, the minutia that makes up normal daily life to most people out here in the world. Um, my brain went blank. Where was I going with that? The minutia of daily. Oh, and I, I, I was telling him, I don't really have, I just like when I hear people talking about stuff like that, my eyes glaze over. I just have no interest in it. And he stopped me and he said, they're still talking about magic. He said, everything, everything that people do is magic. So yes, they absolutely, what they were trying to do by doing what they were doing physically, they were trying to affect non-physical levels of reality. What levels? What were they trying to affect? Number one, they were trying to affect my psyche and the psyche of every single person that showed up and stood in that parking lot and tried to get in that courtroom. They were trying to affect their psyches and they were trying to affect their hearts to make them give up to make them feel despair and to go away. So yes, it absolutely is an act of magic, but like Mark Stavish says, ultimately everything is an act of magic. So yeah, they were, it is, you know, that's one way of looking at it. What was the other part? One, one thing, who was it? Uh, Hypno and Aldo. Let me see, where was it at? Went away real quick. I just needed to remind. Magic and appeals. That's it. Okay, the appeals. So here's what here's where we stand now. I could have walked away from this hearing devastated because I thought this was real. I thought finally. And excuse my hair. Like I said, I haven't been feeling well lately. But I thought finally we're going to um we're going to see justice. You know, for, for a month before that hearing, I would have these waves come over me sometimes, and I would sit there and I would think, this could be over in a matter of days. When we go into that hearing and they order this DNA to be tested, not only can my name be cleared, we can know who actually committed these murders in a matter of days. This could all be behind me forever in days. And I went into that courtroom thinking that was the case. So it traumatized me. It was like getting kicked in the chest by a mule. No lie. It's what made me sick. But it did not destroy me. As a matter of fact, I think what it did is the opposite. What I feel right now and what I want to do right now and what I've been talking to Bob Ruff about, we're going to essentially hit this from a two-pronged approach. You know, I've tried to stay away from this case for 10 years. For 10 years, you know, I was so, so traumatized and messed up when I got out that I was in no shape to be able to, to focus on this stuff. And I also, you know, I was absolutely destroyed emotionally, mentally, everything else. But I also was going through the process of trying to figure out how to live. 
you know, I had never used a computer. I had never used a cell phone. I had never used an ATM machine or a credit card or had a driver's license or any of the things that people think of as being, you know, part of your normal adult life. I had never, I knew nothing about any of that. I had to learn it. I got out when I was 37. At the age of 37, I was having to learn how to live, how to do all of these things that most people start learning whenever they're like teenagers. So for, for most of the past 10 years, it was a combination of extreme trauma that made me want to go nowhere near this case and just trying to put my life and soul back together in a way where I wasn't shattered. I was in no position to do anything on this case at all. The reason this did not devastate me and didn't break me is because I feel like I walked out of that courtroom with a kind of newfound resolution. Now, I feel like a big chunk of my life's work is going to be dedicated to rectifying the situation. By rectifying it, I mean I want to know once and for all who almost got me murdered. I want to know who killed those kids. And I think DNA testing is probably the only way we're ever going to find that out, barring someone making like a deathbed confession, because there's just too many people that have told too many lies and just too many stories that had no basis in reality and, you know, all this kind of crazy stuff. You know, it started the minute we were arrested, just stuff being made up. I don't think there's any way to get to the truth through people. I think the only way we're going to be able to get to the truth of this situation is with hardcore, undebatable science. If you can do that testing and show this person's DNA is the DNA found at the crime scene, that's how the case will eventually end up being solved. But what I mean by we're going to hit this from more than one angle, what the judge ruled, this was, this was her official ruling, and I'm not going to use all the legalese and all the you know, jargon that they use and everything else, but essentially what the ruling was was she says that the law doesn't say you can't do this test that you can do this testing once you're out of prison. The thing is the law also does not say that you can't do it. The law only talks about doing it while you're still in prison. But it does not say that you can't do it once you're out of prison. She just chose to interpret it that way. And spin it that way. So, yes, we are going to appeal. If we have to, we will appeal all the way to the United States Supreme Court. We'll go through the Arkansas Supreme Court. We'll go through federal court, everything else, whatever we got to do. But the other thing is we're going to start lobbying to change the law. We are going to start contacting and approaching every politician in the state of Arkansas and lobbying them to change the law in one way. All we're asking for is to have one tiny phrase inserted into the law. And that phrase is whether in prison or out. That's all we need them to insert into it. And we are going to start contacting every politician in Arkansas that we can 
to try to find one of them that will help us accomplish this. The thing about that is that not only will it help me, but this will also prevent them from doing this to other people in the future. This will prevent them hopefully from executing people without doing the DNA testing. And it will prevent them from railroading people with, with things like the Alfred plea. So this is a chance not only to help myself, but also to help other people who are in some really crappy situations. What was I saying? Oh, helping other people. The other thing is just solving this crime. We want to do what the West Memphis Police Department and the court system has refused to do over the past 30 years. So the reason I wasn't devastated, I walked out of that courtroom feeling kind of like I had a new life's purpose. Number one is changing the law. Number two is actually solving the murders, being able to show once and for all who committed them. And Oh, oh, another thing we're doing is asking people all over the world to write what they call amicus or amicus briefs. This is where people who aren't your attorneys, but may be attorneys in some other way, write briefs to the courts asking them to do what they should have done all along. So we're getting lawyers all over the world to do that. Another thing, um, one thing I'm working on right now is uh, almost as soon as it was over, we, someone from Jay-Z, you know, the rapper Jay-Z, he um, formed this organization called Rock Nation. And it's like a, a philanthropy um, organization is what it, what it is. He, he wanted to use it to, try to change the world for like social justice issues or criminal justice issues or, or whatever, you know, you know, whatever it is. They uh, contacted us and someone from there contacted us and asked if I would be willing to come to New York on, I believe it's going to be July 23rd uh, and talk about the conditions of the criminal justice system um, to, uh, you know, this be on this panel at Rock with, that's being put on by Rock Nation. So hopefully that will also, you know, bring in more connections. There's a lot of attorneys and, and all, you know, people from all walks of life attached to that. So hopefully it will uh, allow us to find people who, you know, can possibly aid and assist us in some way. So the other thing, going back to magic for a minute, because I think this is important. I put a, you know, one of the reasons that I, I've always told people, I've always told people that I have never, ever had magic fail me. Not one single time. It doesn't always work exactly like I think it's going to. It doesn't work exactly like sometimes... I visualize it or like I planned or anything else. But some fruit always comes from it. Always. So I know that this isn't over because I did a lot of, of ritual work for months leading up to this. 
you guys did some with me on here. A lot of energy went into this. So it didn't work out exactly when and how I wanted that I thought at the time would have been ideal. But sometimes if we get what we really want, we screw ourselves out of getting something even better. And I do believe that something even better is going to come from this in some way. You know, one thing that I was doing ritual work for before I left New York, I started to feel like there was nothing in the world I wanted anymore. Like I had no desire for anything. Exactly, Angelica. Angelica says God has something bigger planned. That's, that's, that's my exact point. I think something bigger will come of this. And what could that bigger thing be? It could be potentially changing the law so that this doesn't happen to other people. It could be us finally getting to prove who murdered these children. And it could also be in some way bringing, you know, change to the system in Arkansas to clear out some of the corruption, hopefully. I think something even bigger and better, that doesn't mean, like I said, I was traumatized by it. Yeah, I mean, it, was, it wasn't fun. But I know, it's like, you know, like it says in the Bible, I will give you beauty for ashes. I walked out of there with a mouthful of ashes, but I still am convinced wholeheartedly because of magic and because I have seen over and over and over in my life that magic has never failed me. Exactly. The big nurse says magic sees further down the road. Exactly. It sees further down the road than I can. So I feel in a lot of ways like I came away from this ready to start a new leg of my life, a new journey. See what y'all are talking about. Exactly. Miss Swats you one says this is the great work. Yep, exactly. Thank you, making a mystic. Oh, and thank you for that, Azale. Uh, Azale says, my prayer for you during your trial was that you would have joy and passion that cannot be taken from you by people or circumstances. Thank you. Um, but, you know, I, I feel like I didn't leave this hearing empty handed. Did we get what we wanted? No. Is the fight a long way from over? Yeah. But I feel like I came away from this with something very important, which is a reason, Jillian, which is a reason to uh, a reason that I can dedicate myself to. You know, before I left New York, I was doing magic saying, um, Give me a passion. Let me let me want something again. And now I want I want something. Magic gave me what I asked for. Psych Zero says, how do we make sure they don't tamper with that evidence? We can't. We can't make sure they don't tamper with it. We can't make sure they don't destroy it. Uh, but we can't worry about stuff like that. We can't worry about the things that we can't control. All we can do is keep putting one foot in front of the other, doing the best we can and have faith. Oh, Sparrow Song. Sparrow Song says we can do magic to shield the evidence, energetic boundaries. That's actually a really good idea. Uh, Adias, 
Adius, Adus Angel says, how do we know they haven't already? We don't, but I don't believe they have, or they wouldn't be fighting so hard to keep us from testing it. I think they know that once we test it, we're going to find something. And I think if they had tampered with it, they wouldn't be fighting so hard uh, to prevent us from doing it. <clears throat> so I guess that's pretty much it for the, the, the hearing, um, unless y'all had some questions or something about it. Yeah, Azale says, it seemed like they tried. They said it was lost or destroyed. Exactly. Sunshine. Sunshine says, you have already exposed them, and they have overplayed their hand. From your mouth to God's ear. You know what? That's not a bad idea either. Sparrow Song says, what about... What about finding some of the men who may have been molested as teens or young boys? I know that's a tough one. That's actually not a bad idea. But you're talking about, you know, it was a different world back then. We grew up different than people grew up now. You know, like, like people from the world that I came from, They wouldn't be talking about this kind of, you know, they don't want to talk about this kind of stuff. Most of them, it's a different world. You know, it's, it's not the suburbs. And it's not, it, you know, we were a different generation than, you know, people who grew up on the internet. And people don't like being reminded of how they were traumatized. But it also couldn't hurt anything to try. Exactly. Who said, oh, Sarah. Sarah says there's a lot of shame in talking about that, especially for men, especially in the South. Yeah, there absolutely is. It's one of the reasons you don't, I mean, I've never like went on the news talking about this stuff or anything else. It's because it's very very uncomfortable but at the same time if you don't do it then it's never going to get exposed yeah that's a good point too strum strum and ronin says talking about that is very he said she said that's another thing yeah it's like you know how can you prove it you know, you can say that someone molested you, but how do you, you know, how do you show proof of it? Especially, you know, 30 years later and two of the guys are dead now. See what y'all are talking about. Give me one second. You know, I guess the, the point of it, the whole point of all this, what it comes down to, just to wrap this up, talking about this, is we lost a battle, seemingly, it looks like it, but you never know. I mean, something amazing may come of this in some way. You know, something may come of this that wouldn't have happened if we would have just went through and it would have happened the way we were planning or the way we expected or the way we thought. Something else entirely may come of this. But it looks to us right now like we suffered the loss of a battle. But what we did not suffer is the loss of the war. We're going to continue this in the future. I'll keep y'all posted. Um for what, what people can do to help and everything else as it comes together. I mean, we've really got to formulate a plan now. 
Exactly. John says, that's right. And now you're more fired up than before. Exactly right. But the thing is, I'm not angry either. And I'm not, um, you know, I don't feel this sense of, you know, like I have to do it now. Like it has to be done fast. It's like, uh, you know, if, if there's one thing you learn sitting in a prison cell for 20 years, it's patience. We're going to get there. I walked away from this more determined than I have ever been. We will get there. It will take time. Maybe. I mean, like I said, something unforeseen could happen. But we're just going to keep taking steps. Okay, so let's do talk about magic for just one second. Just because I don't want to do a whole live stream talking about only this stuff, and we don't even touch on magic at all. And I know we're already up to an hour, but we're just going to go into one thing real quick. I'm just, just reading what y'all are talking about. Exactly, Elaine, one day at a time. Gretchen says, slow and steady wins the race, just like the tortoise. Exactly, Joanne. It has become bigger than just us. Yeah, Jacob says, if you won, you would have been like, okay, screw this justice system. I'm done. But now you're going to solve this massive issue. Hopefully. That's what, that's exactly what we're hoping for. Okay, so let me think. Um, I'm looking at some notes I made. One thing I want to do is talk a lot about angels and go into angels more. Uh, there's there's a lot of stuff I want to cover on that just to kind of crystallize some information for y'all. Um, but I think the one thing I want to touch on right now, I saw somebody right before we got on. Um, someone asked about the Rose Cross ritual. They said, what's the what's the, that they're trying to learn it. I can't remember who said it, who asked it, but someone asked, um, what's the point of the Rose Cross ritual? Keep in mind, the Rose Cross ritual is something that you normally do. You were normally given in magic after you had been practicing for between five and six years. Every sphere on the tree has specific rituals and stuff that goes along with it that you're supposed to accomplish, do, learn, memorize, all of that. You were usually given the Rose Cross ritual after you reach the grade of Tippereth, the grade that corresponds to the sphere of Tippereth on the tree. Well, whenever you're, the reason for that and it, it would usually take you between five and six years to reach the grade of Tippereth. The reason they gave you this ritual then is because what you're doing with it is you're, you're literally invoking Tippereth. Well, what is Tippereth? Tippereth symbolizes Christ energy, the energy of Christ. When you invoke when you do the Rose Cross ritual, one of the things that you are doing, just like whenever you do the pentagram rituals and the hexagram rituals and you invoke all the angels and all that, how that gets absorbed by your aura, unless you launch it out and do something with it, it gets absorbed directly by your aura. The same thing happens with the Rose Cross. When you do the, I mean, even think about it. When you do the Rose Cross, when you're drawing the crosses and the circles and then you're charging them with the name Yeheshua. Yeheshua is the name of Christ before they translated it into Greek as Jesus. Jesus was not his name. You know, that's a Greek translation of his name, which would much, much more closely, it would be much, more, much, much closer to Yeheshua. 
So that's what you buy. That's the name you're charging the crosses with. Yeshua. Every time you draw them, charging. So you're charging this whole space with Christ energy, which you then absorb. With every single repetition of this ritual, the point of it is to become more and more Christ-like. That's, that's what it's doing to you on an internal level. Another thing you're doing is when you do rituals, when you're invoking angels and you're doing the, the pentagram and the hexagram rituals, they make you light up like a spotlight on the astral level of reality. This is what people are talking about whenever they say things, you know, how we always talk about how people will say uh, because they don't have any perception of any level of reality beyond the physical. But on some level, they can. Um, they can feel or, you know, how sometimes you just you may meet somebody and two seconds into knowing them, you just get this feeling like this is a smarmy person and I don't want anything to do with it. Or the opposite, you feel like this is a really good person and I like being around. What you're, what you're experiencing is you're perceiving energy because you've only known them for two seconds. It's not based on anything except this direct perception of their energy coming in contact with yours. Well, on some level, even if they're not conscious of it, the reason that's happening is because what they're doing is they are perceiving energetic changes in you. And they'll try to translate it into something they can understand. You know, they'll say, for example, uh, did you lose some weight? Did you get a haircut? Is that a new shirt? Whatever it is. They, they try to figure out how it can be something physical. They don't know it's not something, you know, physical that they're perceiving. The reason they're perceiving it is because you are lit up massively, brightly. You know, this is why they said the God in Lil in ancient Sumer shined so brightly that even the other gods could not look upon him. That's because he had accumulated so much of this energy, this melum, this chi, this divine light, whatever you want to call it. He had accumulated tremendous amounts of the, more so than even any of these other disincarnate intelligences. Well, we're doing the same thing when we're doing all of these pentagram and hexagram rituals. We are accumulating more and more of this divine light. Well, the further people tend to go down the path of magic, and I don't mean people that are just using it for like a way to build their ego or... Uh, you know, any of that stuff. I mean, people who are really serious about this and really dedicating themselves to it and doing it, you'll find those people kind of end up withdrawing from a lot of, a lot of the worldly activities that other people take for granted are just part of, of life out here. They don't necessarily want to be seen. They don't necessarily want to be perceived. They don't want people asking them, is that a new shirt or did you lose weight? So one of the things that doing the Rose Cross does is it veils your aura. It is very much a kind, it, it, a kind of invisibility ritual. And once again, not in the sense that you're going to do this and somebody's going to look at you and see right through you, you know, like, where'd he go? You know, I don't mean that. I mean, when you do this ritual, what happens is people, you, unless someone is specifically looking for you or unless you are doing something to specifically draw attention to yourself, this veils you and allows you to kind of pass through the world uh, a little more unnoticed. So that's one a, a second thing it does. A third thing it does is it tends to heal minor pain. Things like headaches, stuff like that when you do it. 
that's one of like the, the side effects, at least for me. And once again, you know, people go crazy. I'm not telling you not, don't go get any kind of medical attention that if something's wrong with you, the only thing you need to do is the Rose Cross ritual. And I'm not saying any of that stuff. If you need medical help, go get medical help, you know. Just reading what y'all are talking about. Um, but the other thing about the Rose Cross ritual is it aids and assists in you attaining the knowledge and conversation of the Holy Guardian Angel. Because the grade of Tipperath is where you do that. That's your job in the grade of Tipperath. Exactly. Thomas says healthcare is magic too. That being said, I'm probably not the best at taking taking my own advice in that regard. I think I've seen a doctor like three times in 30 years. Um, so I could probably do, you know, use some of my own advice in that regard. Uh, but when you reach the grade of Tipperath, that's where you are supposed to complete the process of attaining the knowledge and conversation of the Holy Guardian Angel. And it's also the grade where they gave you the Rose Cross ritual to do. Added that to your, your ritual practices. Part of the reason is because it definitely speeds up the process. It absolutely does. Oh, who says that? Someone says... Uh... Oh, two things. One, um, Sarah W. Sarah says, my husband deals with chronic pain. Would the Rose Cross help with that or something else? Uh, stuff like that, you just have to try and see. You know, a lot of it depends on, there. it depends on a lot of things. I've had some things, you know, physical ailments that I've used uh, these practices. And I have completely and absolutely been rid of those things. There are other things that for whatever reason, I just, like my eyes. I've done magic on my eyes many times to try to heal them. You know, so that I didn't have to wear glasses anymore. But for whatever reason, it just that's one of the things that um, it just didn't seem to affect. So a lot of the stuff is trial and error. But they tell you, like, if if someone, you know, part of part of what damages us so much whenever we do get sick is all the fear and the anxiety and the despair and the uncertainty and everything else that comes along with the illness. And those things take a huge toll on you. So when you do the Rose Cross, one of the things it does is soothes and eases things like anxiety and fear and all of that stuff. Well, if you ease those things, then they don't have an impact on your health. But if someone is going through a really, you know, difficult time, one of the things that Donald Michael Craig talks about in Modern Magic is like if, if um, you know, the person is, is like in bed, you can do the Rose Cross around the bed where you're not the focal point of it. You're doing it where the focal point of it is the person. What was, I forget where we're going with this. I forgot my brain went blank again. Yeah, that, that's a good way of putting it too. Um, the baked nurse says magic can slow down like the, the, de, de, the degeneration process, which is absolutely true which is also one of the reasons why when you see people doing this work, they tend to have a lot of uh, vitality about them. You know, you'll still get old. Eventually we all get old. Eventually we all die. But there's a difference in say a 90 year old person who has never learned how to work with any of this stuff and a 90 year old person who's been doing it for years. When you look into their eyes, you're going to see a lot more life and vitality in one than in the other.
Oh, the workshops. That's what I wanted to answer, Carly. Uh, Carly says um, she's asking about workshops. We absolutely are going to be doing some workshops in the future. This is another one of the things we're working on uh, in September. The next one is going to be in September because we got a lot going on in the meantime. Uh, we're going back to Joshua Tree. We are going to do another three day long workshop at Joshua Tree uh, in California. I'll keep, that's another thing I'll keep y'all posted on the, um, the information about. We're, you know, talking to the, the place right now and getting all the details and getting everything nailed down. And as soon as that's done and the date is set in stone and they have, you know, the tickets up and all that, of course, y'all are going to be the first ones that hear about it. I have no idea how much it will be, Carly. That's usually set by the place. We have to talk to them still and find out all of that. Um, I don't think it'll sell out that fast just because now that they're, you know, the last one we did, um, I can't remember exactly when it was. I think it was in like, it was this, this past year, but because of COVID, we could have, you know, you had to do the social distancing thing where, you know, everybody had to be put real far apart. So they, they had to really, really limit the amount of people uh, that could come in. So hopefully um, it won't be as bad this year. More people will be able to come uh, and it won't sell out as quick. But that's one of the reasons it sold out so quickly last time is because we could only have a very, very few people there because of, uh, you know, it was like right during all the, the COVID restriction stuff. And now that that seems to be uh, loosening up, We'll be able to have more people. Um, okay, I'm going to shut up for right now. Yes, okay, just reading what y'all are talking about. I'm going to shut up for right now. We didn't touch on any of the things that I wanted to talk about about magic today. And we didn't do... We didn't draw our card. We're going to get back to that as well. And we're also, one of the things, you know, I've been kind of reading through uh, Alchemical Nights, the Alchemical Nights still uh, by Ricardo Villanova. We're going to go back into this. I'm just going to, we're not going to do like a deep dive and read pages and pages at a time, but every so often I come across little things in here that strike me as particularly brilliant or he explains things in a way that, I think are very important for helping, you know, understand the mechanics of things. Um, and that's, that's one of the things I want to touch on with angels is when you truly understand angels, you also understand to a very, very large degree. Uh, you, you get a very, very, a, a much deeper understanding of the mechanics of the universe, how the universe operates, how the universe works, both the external and the internal universes. And I have to get off of here just because I have more calls. I, I'm having to get caught up on all these calls that I wasn't able to do um, because of traveling and Arkansas and, and dealing with, uh, you know, health stuff and everything is kind of backed up on me and I'm working as fast as I can to get everything, you know, sorted back out. Uh, but we will talk, let me see where my calendar is. Do I have my calendar? Here we go. Hold on one second, guys. Bear with me. Just seeing when my next free day are. Free day is. It's not long. What is today? Is today the 29th? It is the 29th. Okay, so tomorrow I have calls. Looks like we'll do it on Friday. We will do the next live stream on Friday, and we will get back into magic 100%. No more case talk. No more, you know, hearings. Uh, it will be back entirely 100% dedicated to magic. We are going to start back on our invoking of the 72 angels of magic, uh, drawing the cards, going through all of those. Um, that's what we're starting back with on Friday, July 1st. Yeah. 
So we will get back to 100% magic. Um, and no more of this. Yeah. Excellent. All right, guys. I just want to say for, for those of y'all um, who came to the hearing, number one, I'm sorry that they treated people the way they did. I'm sorry that you had to go through what you did. I'm sorry you had to stand out in that sun. I'm sorry they would not allow you into the courtroom. I'm sorry that the cops treated you the way they did. Uh, it was not what we were expecting at all. I apologize for that. But I also want to say that you have no idea how much I appreciated y'all turning out, how much I appreciated y'all being there. It makes a world of difference going through stuff like that, having people there that support you. You know, when I went through those trials back in 93, there, was, there wasn't much support at all back then. This makes a huge difference. I, and and it, it really does. It's like, you know how I talked about being traumatized by it, like being kicked in the chest? It's almost like you're not carrying the trauma completely alone by yourself. Like you've got other people helping you do it, like, like taking some of the weight off of you, taking some of the load off of you. And, you know, I'm still the one having to sit there at the table and do the stuff in the courtroom, but it really, you really can tell a difference when you've got a network of support behind you. So I really, really appreciate you guys showing up and, and being there for us like that. Okay, I'm going to shut up. Hopefully, whenever we talk again on Friday, um, I will be completely healed and back to normal and we're going to go back into oh the other thing i know a lot of y'all tried to come and couldn't you know i i heard from several people who went all the way to the airport were getting on planes to come here and their planes were canceled their flights were canceled at the last minute while they were trying to get here i know john john was trying to do that i know that there were other people too you know i was talked like it, it was several people uh, said that, you know, they got at the airport. They were at the airport waiting to fly to Arkansas and had to turn around and go back home because their flights were canceled. So, you know, even that, going through that, that's, you know, the fact that you're willing to subject yourself to that, going through that sort of frustration, uh, means almost as much as if you actually made it to the hearing. Um, so thank you for putting in the time and energy and effort and money and everything else that it took uh, to do this. Thank you guys. Okay. Now I'm going to shut up. Uh, I love y'all and I'll talk to you on Friday.